Therefore, it is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. This morning, the Ontario Association of Food Banks released their annual hunger report. This year, it included a special feature called Shedding the Light on Energy Poverty in Ontario. The report notes, and I quote, Ontario's hydro rates are rising faster than any province in Canada or even the United States, and an 8% government rebate isn't stopping that. The report goes on to say, I quote, Ontario's food banks are seeing an increase in the number of clients who say they simply cannot keep up with their rising hydro bills. I fear this trend will only continue under these Liberal policies. So, Mr. Speaker, given this astonishing report from the Ontario Association of Food Banks and their annual hunger report, question. my question, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Energy is what will this government finally do to help? Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know the uh, Ontario Association of Food Banks are an important partner, and they do ex extremely important work right across our great province. And I know the Minister of Housing and Poverty, the reduction, will uh, will want to comment on this later, Mr. Speaker. But our government is committed to combating poverty and food insecurity, and that's why we've invested $5 billion in affordable housing since 2003, Mr. Speaker. We've raised the minimum wage, and we've done more, Mr. Speaker. But I get, Mr. Speaker, that there are families in this province that are that are vulnerable. And are continuing to struggle, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we've, we want to ensure that we make this um, access to our clean and reliable electricity system also affordable, Mr. Speaker. Um, we, we've introduced the OESP program back in January, Mr. Speaker. That will provide up to $600 on bill rebates, Mr. Speaker, for many of these families, $900 for seniors, Mr. Speaker, and there's also the Low Income Energy Assistance Program, Mr. Speaker. There are many programs out there, and I know we've got more we need to do. Thank you, Mr. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy directly, because the Minister of Energy mentioned the Low, uh, low Income Energy Assistance Program. Well, the report actually referenced that. It said that is insufficient. To put this simply, if you are a single person working full-time for a minimum wage, you are not eligible for LEAP in a rural area. And Mr. Speaker, where is the highest number of, of hydro customers struggling with their bills? It's in rural Ontario, and they're not el eligible. So, Mr. Order. Speaker. According to the report, Minister Chairman and Youth Services rebates, come to order. Inaccessible aid programs do nothing for struggling families. So the minister has just raised a program that has been highlighted in the report as being insufficient. What are you actually going to do to help families? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The programs that we've brought forward, Mr. Speaker, are helping families. We've helped over 145,000 families get on the OSP program, Mr. Speaker. We want to see over 300,000 families get on this program, but unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, on that side of the House, they're not promoting it the way they should to ensure that we can get every family on it as we can, Mr. Speaker. We've got many, many programs that are out there. The 8%. Thank you. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The 8% rebate that we talked about in the speech from the throne, Mr. Speaker, will help 5 million families, farms, and small businesses right across the province, Mr. Speaker. The uh, RRRP program, Mr. Speaker, is going to help over, th over 330,000 families, Mr. Speaker. Answer. And we know we've got more to do, and that's something that the Premier has tasked me with since June, Mr. Speaker. I will continue to work on ways. Thank you. If it's 50 cents or $50, we will help. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy, he referenced this time the OESP program, the Ontario Electricity Support Program. Well, that was also referenced in the Food Bank's hunger report. It said, I quote, this program also is arguably insufficient. With the cost of hydro reaching unprecedented heights, a credit between $30 to $50 per month is not enough to Remember ease from the burden already Russell. placed on low-income households. That's a direct quote from the report. So, these programs aren't reaching people. I don't need liberal spin. I don't need liberal talking points. I don't need you to say that it's not someone else's problem. It's the opposition's fault for not promoting it. Give me a break. You blew the program on liberal consultants. Families are struggling. People can't afford their bills, and this Minister of Energy doesn't care. I don't want spin. When will you help families? Be seated, please. Thank you. 
Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm actually very pleased of a party that is actually helping families. We're the actually party that raised minimum wage, didn't freeze it, it actually helps, helps thousands and thousands of families across the province, Mr. Speaker. We had to rebuild the electricity system that they left in tatters, Mr. Speaker, and was affecting every family and business across this province. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke. Minister, please. The Minister of Children and Youth Services, second time. The member from Renfrew, second time. And if you're not getting the message, we'll go to warnings. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've brought forward many programs that are helping families, but we recognize, Mr. Speaker, that more needs to be done, and that's what we continue to do, Mr. Speaker. We're bringing forward a plan that will continue to help families Answer. with what we have. That side of the House, Mr. Speaker, they have no plans, and they could care less about Thank the you. programs that are out there that are helping families. Thank you. New question. To the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, since I can't get an answer on hydro, let's try something new. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Life is already too expensive in Ontario. We have hydro rates going up, new government fees, and taxes all, all too high. Families are hurting, and the Liberals just can't do anything to help. And instead, they're doing the opposite. Right now, we've heard that the Liberals have given permission Chief to the city of Toronto to charge tolls on the DVP and the gardener. Two dollars every trip may not sound like a lot, but it could be thousands of dollars out of the pockets of commuters each year. So, Mr. Speaker, a direct question to the Minister of Finance. Of Education. Is it true the Liberals are giving the City of Toronto permission to toll the DVP and the gardener? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the uh, Leader of the Opposition, who, uh, who knows uh, all too well how important it is for us to invest in infrastructure, I believe. I believe he also appreciates how important it is to make life easier for the people of Ontario, and now he's asking about the people of Toronto and in the surrounding areas where congestion is, is creating quite a bit of havoc, and we all know that. That's why we're taking the steps necessary to invest in transit, to invest in the infrastructure necessary to improve everyday life, to ensure that we get products to market more quickly and ensure that we get people and families uh, to and from home more safely. Uh, the City of Toronto has put forward some suggestions and some requests. They're going to have it before Council and they'll have to debate the merits of uh, those proposals. Uh, and I would think the member opposite, who has a close affiliation uh, to the leader, past leader of, of the Conservative no, Party, no less, yeah. would have some ongoing dialogue with him as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back uh, to the Minister of Finance. Someone the Minister of Finance has a close association with, the Mayor of Mississauga, has a few thoughts on these tolls, these Liberal tolls. According to the Mayor of Mississauga, these road tolls will affect the residents in Mississauga and all over the 905. Mayor Crombie said, understand the ramifications of these actions on business and tourism affecting Mississauga, not to mention the daily ramifications on commuters. These attacks on 905 commuters must stop. And Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance is offside with his own mayor in Mississauga. So if you won't do it for commuters, will the Minister, will the minister of Finance do it for Bonnie and stop these Liberal tolls? Mr. Speaker, there is as much traffic leaving the city of Toronto into the 905 and into Mississauga as there is going the other way. We recognize how important it is for us to make a fair and improve congestion in the system so that everybody gets to and from work more quickly and more safely. The member opposite also talks about toll roads. He talks a lot about how maybe it shouldn't be the case, and yet, when we had an opportunity to have an outstanding highway system, which was a 407, they sold it for a song, Mr. Speaker. They gave it away, and now we're losing billions annually to a foreign consortium. Mr. Speaker, that's not what we're going to do here. We're going to ensure that we proceed carefully and ensure that we have the best interests of the people of Ontario in mind. Thank you. you see it, please? You see it, please?
start the clock. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Finance, and this, this answer, going back 21 years when I wasn't even old enough to, to, to vote, Mr. Speaker, what I want is a, is a real question, a real answer on the tolls. Why are they giving the City of Toronto permission to toll the Gardner and the DVP? They did a campaign audit in 2014. When they said they wanted to invest in infrastructure, they did not go to the people and say, let us toll the DVP and the Gardner. The reality is they've had 13 years Minister of to invest Education, in infrastructure. Second time. They've had 13 years to invest in public transit. They haven't done anything. And now their solution is to tax people more. Their solution is to toll the DVP and the Gardner. It's not the right thing for commuters. It's not the right thing for the City of Toronto. It's not the right thing Question. for the 905 mayors. You tell me one mayor in the 905 that supports this attack on commuters. Thank Just you. one. You see the Thank you. Mr. Speaker, um, there has been tremendous amounts of investments by this government, historic investments never before made in order to provide for greater infrastructure and paper, greater public transit. We're committing $160 billion over the next 12 years in infrastructure, $30 billion just in, the, in, the, in, in transit, Mr. Speaker, and we take pride in enabling that to happen, recognizing that although he wasn't born or maybe doesn't remember, it was a per it was the mandate of that government not to build transit. And had we taken that effort, then we would have had a better opportunity today, Mr. Speaker. So we'll do our part to invest in transit. Mr. Speaker, it also begs the question, what is their plan? Because they haven't provided any solutions whatsoever, how to fund it, and when are they, what do they build, Mr. Speaker? They're sitting on their hands, they're putting their heads in the sand. We're going to do what's necessary to provide for transit and to make investments that are necessary. Thank you. No question, the member from Beverly Gormalton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> My question is to the Acting Premier. Last week, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change committed to cleaning the English Wab Wabagoon River. However, that's something the Premier has yet to back up and confirm. Instead, the government indicates that there is money for testing the water, but there isn't actually a plan to clean up the mercury, which has been poisoning people and the fish in the river for more than 50 years. Will the government put a commitment to clean up the mercury in writing? Well, um, Speaker, I, uh, I do want to, first of all, welcome the new member to, uh, to this legislature. But this, this, the issue that the member has raised, the member opposite has raised, is a very serious issue, Speaker. And I really want to emphasize that we are listening with and working with Grassy Narrows First Nations. We take those concerns very, very seriously. We are committed to working with them on this issue. We are committed to working with the federal government on this issue, Speaker. And I have to say that given the historical contamination of the river system, officials have worked with the community to provide information on the safe consumption of local fish. The ministry also Answer. continues to provide an alternative supply of safe fish to eat free of charge to the community. Speaker, there are options there. Dredging can make the problem worse. Thank we you. are absolutely committed to doing the right Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, that was a very disappointing answer. There was no commitment in that answer to cleaning up the river. People in Grassy Narrows have been living with mercury poisoning for more than 50 years, and the impacts are devastating. People lose their vision, they lose their hearing, they lose their balance and their ability to speak. Mr. Speaker, something has to be done. After 50 years of uncertainty, the people of Grassy Narrows deserve a clear answer. Can the Acting Premier give a date when the cleanup will begin? And when they plan on finishing this cleanup? Chief Government Whip, second time, Minister. Uh, to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. <clears throat> Thank you. So the Environment and Climate Change. The, um, I want to be very clear that the Premier and I, who have both visited Grassy Narrows, have committed not to a vague commitment, but to a very specific commitment. Oh. Dr. Rudd, who we, we financed 
through uh, the First Nations under the leadership of Chief Officer, undertook a study. He did not say, go in and remove the methylmercury right away. What he proposed was over half a dozen different possible measures. We are now doing exactly what the Chief and First uh, and the First Nations Band Council wanted and Dr. Rudd wanted, which is $600,000 worth of research looking at which measures may work, Answer. which ones could cause further problems, to put options before the community, Mr. Speaker, which is what everybody in Grassy Narrows would like to Thank see you. happen. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the government has been studying mercury contamination in Grassy Narrows for generations. Cabinet has had a plan to clean up the table since 1984. It's time to act plain and simple. There's no time for further studies. We need to act. We need a plan that will actually clean up the river. Chief Oberster of the Grassy Narrows First Nations has asked the Premier to put a promise in writing, quote, so that we know that it is real, end quote. They don't believe that this government is actually going to follow through on anything. The Premier is back from Asia on December 2nd. Will she meet with Chief Oberster and put a promise to clean up the river in writing so that people have some confidence that this government will actually do something? Minister. So, it would be an interesting question to ask the member opposite exactly what measures does his party think should be implemented ahead of completing the work plan, which will actually tell us which measures may work, which ones won't, and what the risks are associated with that. It is not simply a matter of get going in and cleaning up methylmercury and being able to take it out in a week. This will involve probably months and maybe years of work to identify it. It is already underway. Scientists have been out there with First Nation leaderships on the river every week since Minister Zimmer and I were there. Letters have gone back and agreements have been signed. I've got one right here where we agreed to do exactly this. We spent Answer. a day. So I'd like to know why the NDP sleepwalked through five years when they knew this was a problem when they were in government and they didn't even have a conversation with the First Nation for five years. New question. The member from Brandon Lee, Gordon Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. On Thursday, 24 Liberal MPPs stood up and voted for a bill that would make it illegal for someone to accept a bribe in order in exchange to run for office. Can the Acting Premier tell us why the Liberal government thinks it's okay that the Minister of Energy is accused of accepting a bribe when uh, they think that very behaviour should be illegal? Thank you, Premier. Well, Speaker, um, we'll allow this bill to proceed uh, through the normal process, Speaker. It's a question that has, is directly related to a case that is before the courts. And uh, it is the responsibility of this government to ensure that we don't influence the outcome of that case in any way, Speaker. It's inappropriate for any member of this legislature to comment, question, or speculate on any matter of this case, including the legislation. On this side of the House, we respect the courts and the sub judice rule, Speaker. The member opposite, as government house leader, er, as uh, the member opposite, as uh, deputy of the leader of the third party, is fully aware of the procedures of this House. He is a lawyer. He knows how the law works, Speaker. We do not make up legislation on the fly without analysis or discouraging political points. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the government has the, the ability to weigh in on what's appropriate or not appropriate in terms of behaviour. That doesn't require the government to weigh in on the specifics of this case. Ten members of Cabinet voted also to ensure that it should be an offence, it should be illegal to accept a bribe. They voted to say that what their colleague is alleged to have done by a federal prosecutor should be illegal. If they think it should be illegal to accept a bribe in exchange for running for office, then why is the government still allowing the Minister of Energy to remain in Cabinet? Well, uh, Speaker, you know, I think uh, there are questions that need answers. Let me pose one of those questions, Speaker. Um, it was ri widely reported that uh, the member for Bramley-Gormalton 
whilst considering leaving the Ontario Legislature to run for the federal leadership, Speaker. There was broad speculation and more than speculation, Speaker, that this was under consideration. And then all of a sudden, in some unexplained turn of events, Speaker, the member from uh, Brampton, Bramley Gormalton, landed on the front bench as deputy leader of the NDP party, Speaker. I don't know how that happened. It's a bit of a mystery. We sure would love to have some light shone on that particular turn of events. Thank you. Final supplementary. Stones. Mr. Speaker, people across this province expect and believe they need a government that has integrity. They want to have faith in their government. But what they see is a cabinet minister and Liberal MPPs voting it to say that it's illegal to accept a bribe at the same time when they have a sitting member that's accused of the very same actions. He is the recipient of an alleged, he's the alleged recipient of a bribe. He's directly involved in this matter, directly related to what the members and the cabinet minister of this, of this government voted to Guilty. make illegal. To maintain integrity, there's only one option. The minister should step aside. What we're asking the government to do is to maintain faith in this government, to maintain integrity of the government, the Liberal government must act. Will they ask the Minister Question. of Energy to step aside pending the outcome of these allegations? Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Premier. Well, Speaker, maybe we need to have another walk down memory lane here. Let's go back to 2013, where another mysterious turn of events happened. The NDP decided uh, that Adam Giambroni should be their candidate, even though he was, in fact, in charge of the nomination process in that particular riding. And there were, of course, other candidates running. So he was parachuted into the riding, and the party hierarchy, hierarchy allegedly stacked the nomination meeting speaker. And that was with the apparent backing of the NDP leader, the party brass. GM Brony decided that he would like the nomination, even though riding association insiders confess he was not well known to them, Speaker. So Answer. I do think that there are some questions that need answers, and only the NDP can provide answers to those questions. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Deputy Premier. Speaker, the Ontario Liberals can't seem to stop finding new ways for the hands of the government to dig deeper into the pockets of motorists, whether it's for license fee increases, peeling plates, the transport minister's hotline bling, or allowing photo radar anywhere a municipality chooses, motorists are paying the price for the Ontario Liberals' war on the car. And so, Speaker, when it comes to paying road tolls for the privilege of driving on roads we've already paid for, Ontario Motors know it's time to slam on the brakes. Speaker, questions surrounding the introduction of tolls on the DVP and Gardner provide an opportunity to draw a line in the road and stop the government's use of motors as cash cows. Can the Deputy Premier tell us if our government will say no to the Gardner DVP road toll cash grab? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, um, you know, Speaker, I do listen to uh, not just this set of questions, other questions that come from opposition, and I'm always asking myself, I wonder what their plan is. And we do not have any idea what their plan is. What I can tell you, Speaker, is that investments in infrastructure are important investments. We know when they were in office, they did not make any investments in infrastructure. We're doing something different. And the City of Toronto must make investments in their infrastructure as well, Speaker. So we do, we do uh, understand governments have to make difficult decisions. We do understand that road tolls is a subject of conversation in Toronto. Order. If the City of Toronto comes forward with uh, ideas that are backed by their council, Speaker, then of course Answer. we'll take a look at that. Two supplementary. Right. Well, our first plan will be not to waste billions like you have. Here, uh, here, here, here. Billion dollar boondog. You take, you, you toll, take, the, toll. You take this, the prize for that one. Speaker, forcing people to spend more on roads they've already paid for is highway robbery, plain and simple, yes. especially since the Conference Board of Canada told us that GTHA motorists already paid 100 per cent of area road costs. New road tolls on the Gardner and DVP mean they'd be paying more than 100 per cent. In fact, a recent CAA report indicates that policymakers have many tools at hand, make road pricing and should make road pricing a last resort. Speaker, 
With 905 residents already paying full cost for GTHA roads, can the Deputy Premier explain why her government is refusing to speak out against this last resort cash grab on the Dr. Gardner and the DVP? Thank you. Deputy Premier. You know, Speaker, this government has made investing in infrastructure a very, very high priority. Speaker, we are working to build Ontario up. We're working with our partners across the province to invest in projects that reduce traffic congestion, that get people home to their kids more quickly. Speaker, I think that's a priority everyone shares. The difference, though, between them and us is that we know how we're doing that. So let's talk about some investments we're making in Toronto. $3.7 billion for Go RER that forms the foundation for John Tory's uh, Smart Track uh, program. Another $10 billion for Toronto's LRT projects, the Scarborough subway, the Toronto York Spadina subway extension. And we've also increased our gas tax Answer. contribution to the city year over year. Last year, it was $169 million for transit. Speaker, Thank you. We're investing. Question the member from Windsor to come seat. Speaker, earlier today, I bumped into a new member from Ottawa Vanier in the hallway. I Move forward, please. To Queen's Park. I'd like to do so again on behalf of us all. Thank you. My question is for the acting premier. Ontario's food banks are feeding more than 335,000 people a month. Acting Premier, good morning, by the way. That's more than when the recession first hit eight years ago. This year's hunger report from the Ontario Association of Food Banks shows the rapidly increasing cost of hydro is making it even harder for people to put food on their table. In fact, Speaker, Ontario's food banks say the rising cost of hydro is having a direct and devastating impact in the lives of struggling Ontarians. When will this government do the right thing, stop the privatization Question. of Hydro One, and stop pushing people across Ontario into energy poverty? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Speaker, to the Minister of Housing and uh, Poverty Reduction. Minister of Housing, responsible for poverty reduction. Well, thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to the member opposite for uh, such an important question. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Ontario Association of Food Banks uh, for their report and, and for the helpful recommendations uh, contained in it. And I'm pleased that the association recognized the efforts the province has undertaken on housing and the basic income pilot. You know, uh, Speaker, we've seen the, the number of reports uh, uh, that food bank usage has actually decreased uh, between 2015 and 2016. The, the Ontario Association of Food Bank report, however, reminds us that food bank usage has not returned to a pre-recession level, right? So this is, uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, Premier Wynne has instructed me to develop a food security strategy. It's going to focus on improving access to, nutri Answer. to nutritious food across Ontario. Speaker, we know there's more to do, and we're going to continue to build on our progress to improve Thank the you. everyday lives of Ontarians. Supplementary. Interesting spin, Speaker. Hydro rates are out of control. You're pushing families and seniors into poverty. Since 2008, there's been a 23 percent increase in the number of seniors relying on food banks. This government just isn't doing enough to help people who are struggling and falling further behind on their hydro bill. The Hunger Report Minister says, and I quote, the help that currently exists from the provincial government is not comprehensive or inclusive enough for the majority of Ontario families struggling to make ends meet. Speaker, when will this government take real action to get hydro rates under control, under control stop pushing people into poverty, and stop any further sell-off of Hydro One. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. First off, as we are all aware in this House, um, the broadening of Hydro One does not have an impact on the rates. The OEB sets the rates, Mr. Speaker, and that's been very clear. But what I do understand, Mr. Speaker, is that, that families are suffering, Mr. Speaker. I do understand that there are vulnerable families out there that do have a hard time uh, paying their bills, Mr. Speaker. I get that. When I was part of the United Way, Mr. Speaker, even back in 2003, there were programs in place, Mr. Speaker, to help the food banks, to help the United 
targeted way to help the Red Cross buy places like Union Gas and other um, electricity utilities to help families pay their bill, Mr. Speaker. But we get that there's still families having difficulty, and that's why we brought forward the OESP program, the Ontario Electricity Support Program, Mr. Speaker, that will actually help Remember from Hamilton up to Stony Creek. dollars if they actually heat their, their homes with electricity. Mr. Speaker, there are many things that we have out there, and there are many things that we will continue to do. Thank you. New question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Today, we are pleased to have the Ontario Association of Interval and Transition Houses with us in the Legislature. The OAITH is a coalition of first-stage emergency shelters, second-stage housing, and community-based organizations who work tirelessly every day to end violence against women. I'm proud of the tireless work being done by Kingston Interval House in my riding, and I want to acknowledge once again Pam I'm Havery, the executive director, for her work and steadfast commitment to women's safety. Mr. Speaker, we know that the prevalence is staggering and that one in three women have experienced some form of violence in their lives. We know that women will return to their um, violators eight times before being free. Question. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please inform the House of the important work that OAITH does to support victims of family violence and thank how you. the ministry supports them in this? Mr. Community Social Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member from Kingston and the Islands for the question and for her advocacy on this important issue. The work of OAITH and VAW shelters and agencies touches thousands of women and children and makes the lives of those they serve better. Every November, OAITH launches their Wrapped in Courage campaign to increase awareness of women abuse in Ontario. And I know I speak for all members in the House when I say that we are extremely proud to be wearing this purple scarf to let women and their children know that they are not alone. In July of this year, I was pleased to announce $100,000 in funding to OAITH to help deliver training to the violence against women sector across the province. The training will include online resources and modules that cover a broad range of issues, including domestic and sexual violence. This will ensure that workers in the field are able to Answer. provide even better service. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. Thank you to the Minister for her answer. Clearly, this government recognizes the great work organizations such such as OAITH do in our province. Speaker, unfortunately, the members in this House are well aware that violence against women preva remains prevalent in our society. More than 10,000 women and over 6,900 of their children were served by an emergency shelter last year. Violence against women affects us all, not just the women who are the victims, it's their children, their families, and also their communities. Speaker, our government has increased spending on programs to reduce violence against women by over 60 per cent since 2003. However, we know there is more work to be done. The province has initiated several other programs, such as the It's Never OK Action Plan, which aims to stop, stop sexual violence against women in Ontario. Women deserve Question. to live in an Ontario free from violence. Could the minister please outline how we continue to support OAITH and the violence against women's Thank sector? You, minister. Speaker, I'm proud to say that my ministry invests $147 million every year to support the violence against women sector. And some of these investments include $1 million to the Rural Realities Fund to help rural, remote, and northern agencies develop local solutions that address the unique challenges in serving their communities, $1.5 million in Aboriginal designed and delivered community services, including the development of an expanded province wide counselling helpline for Aboriginal women and $17 million over three years through the Ministry of Housing for a portable housing benefit pilot which will support up to 3,000 survivors of domestic violence across 22 municipalities. I'd like to thank OAITH and all the shelter EDs and staff with us here today. Your work makes a real difference in the lives of women and their children who have experienced yes, domestic violence. Mr. Speaker, let's make this a transformative time for women in Ontario and build a safer future for every woman and girl in thank this you. province. Your question, the member from Leeds. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Last week, Ottawa patients, healthcare professionals, and community leaders were shocked and very disappointed to learn that the unelected National Capital Commission overturned an eight-year decision by the Ottawa Hospital to rebuild across the street on the experimental farm. Instead of keeping the Civic Campus and the Heart Institute together, the NCC picked the sixth 
ranked Tunney's Pasture location, which isn't as accessible for patients and ambulances, will cost more because it will require demolishing existing buildings, and it will inevitably delay the much-needed rebuild. And my question to the minister is, will he intervene with the federal government and demand that Ottawa patients come first in order that the Ottawa hospital build on the appropriate site, its preferred site, at the civic, at the, across from the civic campus? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long -term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. And I also appreciate the fact that the member acknowledged that it is a, a federal issue in terms of the uh, ultimate decision uh, with regards to the siting of the new uh, civic hospital. Uh, what I'm proud of, however, Mr. Speaker, is that there has been a, a significant community process and engagement uh, of uh, virtually of the of the residents that uh, could potentially be impacted by those uh, that benefit from the services that are uh, provided at the current hospital, Mr. Speaker. That those are concerned about uh, with legitimate concerns with regard to the siting or the possible uh, uh, options for siting the hospital. There has been a recommendation put forward by the National Capital Commission. That's all it is at this point, Mr. Speaker. It is a recommendation following a process that they led. It's now up to uh, the federal government and the federal cabinet to review that recommendation along with Answer. other uh, uh, considerations and make an ultimate decision, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. The hospital rebuild will be funded by the provincial government. You are the major stakeholder. In fact, my constituents are major stakeholders as well, and they expect that you will follow what the uh, Ottawa Hospital has recommended, which is the site of the experimental farm directly across the street. The only Ottawa residents on the NCC, there were only three of them, they did not support the change to Tunney's Pasture. Um, the president and CEO of the hospital, Dr. Jack Kitts, does not support the new site. Former mayors, Jackie Holtzman and Jim Durrell, oppose the move. Former CEO, Ray Hessian, has opposed the moves. The physicians and community leaders I have spoken to over the weekend resoundedly reject the interference of where our hospital should be located. The choice by the local health care experts is the experimental farm in Ottawa across the street from the existing hospital and from the Heart Institute. It's accessible, it's the right Russia. size, and it's closer to shovel-ready. Will the minister be on the side of Ottawa patients and against the federal government's recommendation to build that hospital on the preferred site? Thank you. Minister Health, well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, I'm definitely on the side of patients with regards to the provision of health care services in the province of Ontario. Uh, the member does know, of course, that the hospital has a board, which is a community board, which is representative of the community that benefits from that service, as well as those that are residents there. Uh, that, My understanding is the board is meeting tonight. They have not yet uh, made a determination or a recommendation based on this information that came last uh, week from the National Capital Commission. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, I think it's appropriate that we not insert ourselves in a community process aimed at citing a hospital within a jurisdiction, no more than with the Windsor Hospital as well. There's been a long consultation process with regards to citing of that hospital as well. I think the three members that represent that jurisdiction in Windsor would agree with me when I say it's important that we let the community Answer. decide with appropriate safeguards in a community-led process to decide where they believe the best citing should be. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. A member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Acting Premier. My community is reeling from this government's decision to pull $20 million more from health care in my community by saddling local hospitals with the cost of a forced merger of Ajax Pickering Hospital with Lake Ridge Health. That will mean fewer hospital beds, fewer nurses, longer wait times, and more cuts to patient care. Thousands in my community have signed a petition calling on the minister to reconsider this decision, but instead of listening, the minister is plowing ahead. How does this government expect our local hospitals to find $20 million to pay for this forest merger without cutting patient care? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Long care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of the work that's been done over the past year, year and a half, by community members right across Scarborough and across Durham as well. And I referenced, I think, last week the uh, the $20 million investment in the Scarborough Hospital, the five, uh, $10 million investment, I believe, for a new emergency hospital at Rouge Valley. And when it comes to Ajax Pickering, just last week I made the announcement that quite the opposite of decreasing services, I provided guarantees in terms of the sustainability of the services that are there, like the shoulder program, I actually announced that there would be 20 new mental health inpatient beds wow. at Ajax Pickering Hospital. Those beds that were taken away 
previously are coming back to Ajax Pickering. I also indicated that the name of the hospital is going to rec rec represent the local community. Those investments that they've made in assets that the foundation Answer. has generated the funds for, all of those things are going to continue and the services are going to continue to improve, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Um, the minister is talking about community and has talked about consulting with the community, yet the community doesn't feel like they've been consulted at all. In fact, members of the community are here today to make their voices heard. Last week, the minister quietly signed the integration order for the merger, something he neglected to mention when I asked him during question period that same day. Did it slip his mind, or is it just another example of how this government has tried to ram this through as quickly and as quietly as possible? This is death by a thousand cuts. Or really, it's more like death by almost 20 million cuts. Will the minister please listen to my community and prevent the damage he could be doing to our local hospitals? Thank you, Minister. Well, um, I hardly see how issuing a press release announcing the integration is doing it quietly, Mr. Speaker, yeah. because that's what I did when I announced the 20 new inpatient beds, when I talked about the importance of sustaining the services that are there. And I think the member opposite needs to speak to the community and the representatives of the community, including the friends of Ajax Pickering Hospital, who I met with uh, two weeks ago, who I spoke again last week as well, who are very satisfied with the approach that we're taking and in agreement with the safeguards and the measures that I took in place. Order. If she would stop talking and actually listen to my response, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, she would understand that the community actually is confident that the steps that we're taking are going to preserve and, in fact, enhance the services at that important local community hospital. Thank you. Your question, the member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is also to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, and this is a question that I know is of intense interest to our new member from Ottawa, Vanier. And, Speaker, if I could just take a moment to note, not only was our new member a prestigious uh, uh, dean of a prestigious law school, she also was sporting her Order of Canada. Now, that's the kind of candidate we can attract to this side of the house. My my question concerns on health care, Speaker. Providing Ontarians with timely health care is, of course, extraordinarily important. And just last week, Speaker, in Beaches East York, I was able to make an announcement for almost a million new dollars to the Toronto East Health Network to assist with local health care. And so, Minister, I know the Minister was in Ottawa Region last month to make a very important announcement, Speaker. And I would wonder if the Minister could update this House on the investments question. that we are making to improve access for care for patients in eastern Ontario. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for this very important question and giving me the opportunity to talk about a great project that's now underway at Carleton Place and District Memorial Hospital. And in fact, a few weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, I was in Carleton Place with my colleague across the legislature, the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington, and I want to commend him for his hard work and advocacy on be behalf of that hospital. And to Together, we were able to announce, Mr. Speaker, that we're building a brand new emergency department at Carleton Place Hospital, a new project that's going to compri be comprised of 9,000 square feet. Uh, sorry, a 9,000 square foot addition to the hospital it will reduce wait times and improve care for patients and their families in eastern Ontario. And while visiting Carleton Place, I had the privilege of meeting with many patients and the hard-working healthcare professionals of Carleton Place. I know that these individuals, as well as the member from Answer. Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington, are excited about this opportunity to grow their hospital and improve health care at that hospital. Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Minister for these incredible initiatives in eastern Ontario and, indeed, for the hard work he is doing to modernize health care in the province of Ontario. And it's great to hear of these significant investments the government is making right across our province. I know our government is making reducing the time we spend in Ontario emergency rooms a priority. I also know that we have seen positive results from, since our government implemented the Wait Times Strategy. Wait Times Alliance, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, the Fraser Institute have all found year over year that Ontarians have entirely better access to care in this province. And since 2008, Ontario hospitals have been able to decrease 
the time spent in, in emergency rooms by almost 16 per cent. Speaker, will the minister Question. please inform us, and then all, all the House, what other investments we are making at Carleton Place Hospital, which will mean and what it will mean for patients in eastern Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is, I think, a great example of legislators working together. And again, I want to give credit to the member from Lanark uh, because he advocated strongly. He brought the mayor to come and see to see me and speak about the needs of the hospital as well. And we worked together over a reasonably uh, short period of time, I would say, to actually uh, arrive at the stage where the government is investing almost nine million dollars to redevelop that emergency department at Carleton Place and District Memorial Hospital. It's going to have a big impact uh, uh, with enhancing the ability of individuals to get timely care through their emergency, uh, providing a large number of diagnostic, technological and therapeutic tax tasks. And this new emergency department will ensure that, that more patients, even more patients, are able to receive emergency health services where they need them Sir. and when they need them. And the project will result in expanded services which are better for the local community. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance this morning. I'd like to quote a former member of the legislature who said on Thursday that selling a major electricity utility wasn't necessary to build infrastructure in the city of Toronto. Too, Mayor John Tory oh. said the city is the sole shareholder of Toronto Hydro, and that is an investment that I take seriously. That's more seriously, apparently, than the Premier of Ontario took her obligation to Hydro One customers. Speaker, now that the Mayor of Toronto has admitted that privatization isn't the right way to go, will the Minister stop the fire sale of Hydro One shares? Good question. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Speaker, the uh, broadening of that ownership, we've now had two tranches. It's been highly successful, anything but a fire sale, because we were receiving a lot more than it was ever anticipated. And unlike what they did opposite, Mr. Speaker, by giving away the 407 all in one swoop without a, uh, an ability for the market to respond, taking the full risk and, Mr. Speaker, without the control measures necessary to control the pricing. All of that's been done. It's being done in a gradual way. Greater receipts have been now afforded to the province. We are still the largest shareholder and will always continue to be, and we're investing dollar for dollar in new infrastructure, in new transit, and in the ability to be more competitive long term. The returns that we're going to be getting, Mr. Speaker, are, will be and are much higher than it was when we held uh, Hydro One in its uh, a traditional way, Answer. Mr. Speaker. So we're going to invest, and we're going to ensure that more money is made for the people of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, Unfortunately, nobody, nobody believes what uh, the member is saying, and this is one of the members who cost us over a billion dollars in the gas plant scandal. Shameful. Over 80 per cent of people in central Toronto oppose the sale of Hydro One. That's over 80 per cent. The members on the government side should actually listen to that number. Yep. It's massive. The people of Toronto overwhelmingly opposed selling Toronto Hydro. The City Council overwhelmingly opposed selling Toronto Hydro. Hydro rates are the number one issue for all Ontarians, regardless of where they live, Mr. Speaker. Yep. Speaker, why is it that the Mayor of Toronto is capable of listening to constituents when it comes to keeping hydro in public hands, but this government continues to ignore the will of the people Question. of Ontario. Speaker, the minister, will he simply admit that the mayor is right to stop the further fire sale of Hydro One? Yeah, hey. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we're making $4 billion in that transaction, all of which is going into the Trillium Trust to ensure it gets reinvested. And, Mr. Speaker, it's evident that a dollar invested in these infrastructure projects provides $4 in the long term. And, Mr. Speaker, that's essentially what is happening here. The additional $5 billion from that transaction is going to pay down debt. And as we proceed forward, we're going to create more revenue and, at the same time, Mr. Speaker, and this must be reaffirmed. We will always retain 40% ownership of Hydro One. We will always have that opportunity for improving those dividends and making certain that the company operates more efficiently, more effectively, and produces greater results for the people of Ontario. Further note, there's 72 competitors 
in competing with Hydro One. And it's essential for everyone to acknowledge that the more we put this in perspective, Answer. the greater the competitiveness and the nature of Hydro One. And the OEB, which is the one who controls the pricing, did not increase pricing last quarter, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Energy. There is a newspaper report today showing that food bank use is soaring because families can't afford to pay their hydro bill and their electricity bill. Sorry, my apologies, Speaker. Their hydro bill and their grocery bill. This past summer, the Minister of Energy refused to call energy poverty a crisis, even though 60,000 Ontario families have had their hydro cut off. We can expect the number of disconnections to soar next spring when Hydro One will resume cutting off families who can't pay their bills. The United Way of Bruce Gray has called for a moratorium on hydro disconnections in Ontario. Will the minister agree to this moratorium? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and uh, I know that there are, are families that are out there having difficult, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to electricity, and it's important that vulnerable customers uh, have the resources to help avoid the disconnection, and that's why we've overseen uh, enhanced consumer protection rules, including requiring a 10-day advance notice of dis disconnection, Mr. Mr. Speaker, which accompanying resources that will go with this notice, Mr. Speaker, to help customers in, the re in arrears, Mr. Speaker. We also have that right now. We've given those powers to the OE be, but we do have a bill in front of the House right now, Mr. Speaker, Bill 27, that I do hope they will all support, even unanimous support, Mr. Speaker, that will ensure that there will be no uh, disconnections during the winter months, Mr. Speaker. That is in front of the House right now. I hope all parties will support that, Mr. Speaker, because we do recognize that more work needs to be done, and that's what we're continuing Answer. to do, Mr. Speaker. We've actually got programs out there to help, the OESP program, the LEAP program, but there is more to do. Thank you, Mr. Supplementary. Speaker. Speaker, the Premier has finally acknowledged that soaring hydro prices are a, quote, mistake, but the minister refuses to do anything to correct that mistake. He won't halt the sale of Hydro One, even though we know that privatization is going to drive prices up even further. He won't direct the Ontario Energy Board to put the interests of consumers ahead of the private investors who will benefit from that privatization. Will he at least agree to a moratorium on hydro disconnections? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said, there is legislation in front of the House right now that I hope that they will actually support, Mr. Speaker. We'd even take unanimous consent on it, Mr. Speaker, right Bill down. 27, right that will actually put a moratorium on disconnects during the winter months, Mr. Speaker. We've got that, plus we've got the 10-day notice, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. There are many, many things that this government has done to ensure that we actually help families that are struggling. We know there is more to do, Mr. Speaker, and we've been doing that. When it comes to looking at um, the announcements that we've made, Made, Mr. Speaker, just in the last two months, our governments had significant and put significant efforts in to ensure that electricity rates are kept affordable, Mr. Speaker. You know what? We will continue to work hard, and if it's 50 cents in savings, Mr. Speaker, or it's $50 in savings, Mr. Speaker, we will look at all aspects that we can Answer. do, Mr. Speaker, to help families. Because we understand that the OESP program is there as a program, the LEAP program is there Thank as a you. program, but there is more to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Minister, infrastructure is relied upon by millions of Ontarians for everything from transportation to clean, safe drinking water. Our government is building Ontario up for people in every corner of the province by making a historic investment in public infrastructure, a multi-billion dollar job-creating program that the opposition opposes. I know that positive partnerships between business and government are key to delivering larger projects, including in my riding of Barrie, where the expansion of the Royal Victoria Regional Health Centre resulted in the opening of a new cancer centre with space to serve 2,000 patients annually. I know that the minister oversees Infrastructure Ontario, the agency tasked with managing infrastructure projects, 
all across Ontario, which is doing great work on Question. behalf of the people of the province. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could he please elaborate on the effectiveness of Infrastructure Ontario's thank efforts you. to build bridges minister. between business and government? Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And she is correct. Our government is making the largest infrastructure investment in Ontario's history, including in each single riding of the opposition. And the member knows that the opposition has no credible plan to build the infrastructure Ontarians need. In fact, the leader of the opposition was a member of a Conservative government whose anemic investments contributed to the infrastructure deficit we suffer today, Mr. Speaker. And, Speaker, we invest double the amount in infrastructure that the opposition leader did for all of Canada. And we want to be sure that projects are delivered on time and on budget. The largest projects are delivered through a made-in-Ontario model called alternate financing and procurement. AFP has a track record of success. 98% of the first 45 projects were completed on budget, Mr. Speaker. And, Speaker, AFP is a Answer. success story that has saved the people of Ontario $6 billion. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the minister for his response. I'm glad to hear that Infrastructure Ontario is diligently supporting our government's commitment to create jobs and stimulate growth. I know that ridings across this province, including many ridings represented by the members opposite, will benefit from $160 billion our government is investing in schools, hospitals and rapid transit. And with much more to be built, that investment will continue creating jobs and stimulating growth well into the future. That means our government will continue delivering good jobs for Ontario's every corner of this province, from Windsor to Waterloo to North Bay, even if the opposition is opposed to the plan and projects that create jobs. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could he please elaborate on what the future holds for the alternative financing Question. improvement model? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, our government is announcing more important infrastructure projects every month. Infrastructure Ontario just released its annual market update, outlining upcoming projects that include hospitals, courthouses and rapid transit, much of which will be, will be built using our AFP public-private partnership model. These projects represent $11.8 billion in investments, in addition to $32 billion already invested in past projects. Uh, the third party, Mr. Speaker, uh, is ide ideologically opposed to triple, triple P's, Mr. Speaker. The third party can disagree, but the facts Order. are clear. AFP is a successful procurement model with broad support, not just in this government, Mr. Speaker, but among the NDP's base, including trade unions who work on P3 projects and many union pension plans who invest heavily in P3 projects. Answer. Mr. Speaker, their friends are investing in triple P's in the AFP Thank market, you. Mr. Speaker, in hospitals and all kinds of other infrastructure. Your question, the member from Bruce Street, Owen South. The Deputy Premier. Hydro hikes have trapped our public institutions into a catch-22. Sure Either they cut services or they run deficits. Yep. Meaford Hospital is the most recent one to face the brutal consequences of hydro hikes. Either they shut down the emergency room or run a deficit to cover utility hikes. Just to be clear, no emergency services means longer travel times for critically ill patients. It means patients have to wait longer and get sicker. And frankly, it could mean the difference between life and death. This is wrong, Mr. Speaker, and another mistake by the Premier. And sadly, it is why no leader in the history of the province has lost the confidence of the people so quickly and by so much like the Premier. So my question is, has the Premier gotten so tired and so out of touch that, poll, that she won't Speaker. commit to stopping the yes. sale of Hydro Very One and another mistake poll. before it does any more damage to the health of Ontarians? Support. The, uh, uh, the Deputy Premier is not available. Would you like to re refer, uh, defer your question to somebody else? We'll go to uh, finance. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and the member opposite makes reference to the integrity of the leader of this party and this government and the Premier of Ontario, who has taken every step necessary to make decisions on the best interests of the people of Ontario. 
I take great pride and value in the work that she's been doing, recognizing that we need to take a balanced approach to invest in our economy, invest in the people of Ontario, invest in their skills and training, Mr. Speaker, investing in infrastructure so that we have a more competitive economy, and making sure that our dynamic cl business climate attracts even more investments from around the world. That's why we become one of the top destinations for foreign direct investment. And more importantly, Finish, please. And more importantly, Mr. Speaker, she takes every necessary step to create a fair society Answer. where no one is left behind to ensure those most vulnerable are given the supports most necessary. Unlike that party opposite, she supports more Thank minimum you. wage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the finance minister. I respectfully remind you, sir, and your, all of your colleagues, that Ontarians don't approve of your government's hydro policies. You? In fact, they feel they're at war with you Chair, all. Please. Again, Mr. Speaker, hospitals are getting walloped by hydro hikes, and patients' lives are being put at risk. First, the hydro hikes were dictating how many surgeries would be cancelled, and now they're dictating emergency room closures and access. This is wrong, Mr. Speaker, and another mistake. We want to know, since the finance minister won't stop the fire sale of Hydro One, how is he going to fix the mess that he and his government have created and ensure our hospitals can provide the care people expect and deserve? Here, here, here. So, Mr. Speaker, indeed, uh, this side of the House made the necessary investments to make our grid more competitive and more secure. We invested billions in more transmission, in new production facilities, and became emissions-free. 93% of emissions in this province are free of carbon, Mr. Speaker. That means we've had no more smog days, zero, last year. We'll continue to take those steps. At the same time, jurisdictions around the province of Ontario are going to now have to make those investments, which we have made. And while we're doing these, we've taken the necessary steps to provide programs to alleviate and support uh, those hydro uh, costs and rates as we do with our programs, as we've just done in our our throne speech to reduce 8 per cent of the provincial portion of the HST, which is coming out, by reducing the debt retirement charge, a charge which was a legacy of that government, Mr. Speaker, and that's part of the House, so that we can make it more affordable for people of Ontario. We know there's more to be done. We are taking those steps. In the meantime, we've got clean air and we have an integrity in our, in our system, Mr. Speaker. Any questions? The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. In Markdale, the closure of Beavercrest Community Elementary School would devastate the community and hinder economic growth in the area. Chapman's went so far as to offer to buy the school. Even the mayor of Grey Highlands offered to offset deficit spending. Hundreds more schools like Beavercrest may be on the chopping block. Schools like Queen Victoria, Hugh Beaton and Prince Edward in Windsor. Rather than providing community schools with the resources to stay open, this government is cutting rural grants, eliminating base top-up funding, and grossly underfunding renewal needs. Speaker, if business, local politicians, students and families can see the value of schools like Beaver Crest and those in my community, then why doesn't this government? Thank you. Minister of Education. Speaker, I want to thank the Let member opposite the, for this question. Mr. Schools. Speaker, what was their plan for education, no Mr. Speaker? No their plan for no education, school. in no fact, no was school. to was to, in fact, implement a $600 million cut. Wow, $600 million. $600 million cut, Speaker. So when it comes to our investments in education, Mr. What Speaker, we have increased dollars. the budget for education, Mr. Speaker, since 2003. They would have Mr. taken Speaker, a chainsaw to the budget. Chainsaw. We have yeah. ensured that there is— agriculture. We have ensured, Mr. Speaker, that we make considerations for rural schools. Mr. F Mr. Speaker, $199 million more dollars for rural schools schools, taking into consideration the unique factors Answer. that exist. So, Mr. Speaker, we're working with our local communities, we're working with our local school boards to working ensure that they meet the education needs of the children of this province. There being no oh, sorry, the member from Kitchener-Waterloo on a point of order. From Kiki Bamberger to Queen's Park for the first time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the cascade begins. The Minister of Labour. Order. I just looked up in the uh, in the stands in the gallery and noticed Diane Boileau was here from Halton Women's Place. Please welcome her to Queen's Park. Thank you. <laughs> the member from Windsor to Cumsey. 
Mr. Speaker, I know we all know Janet in the gift shop. She's retiring at 1 o'clock today in uh, 228. There's a reception. Sorry? Is that your new seat? If you, if you have a point of order, it needs to be made from your seat. Any others? No deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.